Hi, my name is Anthony McMullen, current vice chair of the Arkansas Bar Association's Mock Trial Committee. And this is a presentation on direct examination and acting protocols. These slides were authored by Barrett Moore, the current chair of the Mock Trial Committee. This is part of the Mock Trial Lecture Series, sponsored by the Mock Trial Committee and the Arkansas Chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates. Let's begin. Now, the late Justice Antonin Scalia once wrote that the rules that generally apply to witnesses serve the truth-seeking function of the trial. The entire point of a trial is to seek the truth about a given dispute. So, for example, let's say that we have an automobile accident at an intersection caused by a driver running the red light. Whoever ran the red light is probably going to be the one held responsible for that accident. So, you might have a trial on, did John run the red light and hit Jane? Or did Jane run the red light and hit John? In the mock trial competition, both sides, the plaintiff or the prosecution, depending upon whether it's a criminal case or a civil case, and the defendant will be able to call three witnesses to prove or defend their respective sides of the case. Now, much of what you're going to have in this video is based off of mock trial rule of evidence 611. And I've got certain portions of that rule here, you'll be able to go to the rule and review the specifics of the rule, but part of this video is to go over this rule as well as other protocols of what makes a really good direct examination. So the rule talks about the scope of cross-examination, in other words, what can and cannot come out in a cross-examination, protocols for leading questions, which we'll discuss in this video, protocols for redirect examination and recross examination in those events that it happened, and finally permitted motions. Now, I'll cover permitted motions briefly. If a line of questioning or a piece of testimony is objected to and the judge sustains that objection, then the person who objected to it should move to have that piece of evidence or that testimony stricken from the record. And that is the only motion that's really allowed after an objection which you'll see in Rule 611E. But let's get to the other portions of the rule. If you go back to subsection A of 611, you'll see that the court has three goals when it comes to admitting direct examination. Seek the truth, avoiding time, waste, and preventing a witness from being unduly harassed or unduly embarrassed. Now, even though it's the judge's role to prevent undue harassment or embarrassment, if you are a witness or if you are a party in a particular case, you should still expect to be subject to a very probing examination. A lot of what we're going to have in this video will provide ways to make an effective examination if you're an attorney or a way to present yourself effectively if you're a witness. So let's get to finding the truth while avoiding objections. If you're a lawyer, then your witness must know the key points about their testimony and be prepared to elaborate. As a lawyer, your first job is to lay a foundation for the testimony. In other words, what's the basis for this witness having this information? So you might ask questions such as, who are you? Why are you here? What did you see? What background and experience qualifies you to give testimony about this case? It's all about building a witness's credibility. And why should the jury or why should a judge believe this witness? You have to lay that foundation first before moving on to anything else. Once the foundation is laid, then you can move to the key facts at issue. So, again, take our hypothetical automobile accident. You might ask questions such as, were you at the intersection of College and Maine on May 12, 2015? What did you see? What makes you sure that the southbound light stoplight was red? Did any vehicles drive through that red light? If so, please describe that vehicle for the jury. It's more than what did you see. It's a lawyer asking questions one that builds upon another to focus on the key facts 
at issue. In this case, our hypothetical lawsuit focused on the key issue of which driver ran the red light. Generally, leading questions are not going to be allowed on direct. Now, what exactly is a leading question? Well, a leading question is any type of question that suggests a specific answer. Generally, these are going to be questions that are answered by yes or no. So if you're asking questions such as, didn't Jane ran, run the red light? Or did you see Jane's blue Corvette run the red light? You know, these are types of questions that suggest an answer, and they're going to be objected to and rendered inadmissible. So you should instead ask questions that are open-ended. Did you see any vehicles that ran the red light? Can you describe that vehicle? Things that get the witness to talk and to be the star, not the attorney. So generally, no leading questions. Now, of course, some trials require some level of leading questions to move the case along in a timely fashion. And if it's on a relatively unimportant matter, then a leading question is going to be okay. But be careful, don't cross that line. If you're asking nothing but leading questions, a judge is going to put a stop to it. So yes, feel free to use it if it's on a small, unimportant matter to get things moving along, but you should try your best to avoid them throughout your direct examination. In addition, during your examination, make sure that everything that you're asking about is indeed relevant. Probing into an area of unrelated facts and into areas that have no tendency to prove or disprove those fights, facts invites a challenge to relevancy and unfair prejudice under rules 402 and 403. So if you ask a question such as, does Jane Doe have a reputation for cheating on her taxes? Generally, taxes have nothing to do with an automobile accident. That information is irrelevant. And even if you can make an argument that it is relevant, chances are it is so prejudicial that it ought to be excluded. So be sure that the information that you're seeking to admit is relevant to the points that you're trying to make in your presentation. Even though you are operating under a time limit in the mock trial competition, you should still be sure that you continue your direct examination and be sure that you extract every critical piece of evidence from your witness. Once you end your direct examination, you may not get another chance to develop that testimony. First of all, there's going to be a cross-examination. And once the cross-examination is over, you're, um, you may be able to get up for a recross, but any recross is going to be limited to the scope of questions that you've already asked or the scope of things that came out in cross-examination you cannot bring up entirely new lines of questioning in a redirect. So if you sit down without ex extracting every key piece of information from your witness, you're probably not going to get that opportunity again with that witness. In addition, you must be sure that you admit all necessary exhibits through your witness. If you go to rule a competition 4.20, it provides a really good script for you to follow when it comes to admitting exhibits into evidence through a witness. It's a pretty simple script. Your Honor, I'm showing you what we've marked as Exhibit 3. You hand that to the witness. Witness, what is this document? And where did you take this photograph? Is it a fair and accurate depiction of the scene of the accident that you took on your cell phone following the collision? Do what you can to establish what the item is and its authenticity, and then you move to admit the, ref the item. If there are no objections, it'll be admitted. If there are objections, be prepared to respond to those objections. And then, if there are objections, the judge will have to make a decision as to whether it is admitted or not. And if it's not admitted, you should at least still move to proffer the exhibit. And that's just a fancy way of saying I'm putting it in the record not to admit it in the evidence, but in the event that there's an appeal later. Now, it's just something that you should do as part of the mock trial competition. We don't have appeals in this competition, but it still should be something that you do. In addition, if it is admitted, you should be sure that you publish the 
exhibit to the jury. The jury needs to see what the exhibit is so they can um, see what the witness is testifying about. And make sure that the jury reviews the exhibit during the remainder of the examination, but make sure that it doesn't operate as a distraction to the jury during the rest of your examination. The timing is important and you don't want the jury to be reviewing that exhibit when you've moved on to another important part of the direct examination. Now, after the direct examination, the opposing counsel will get to cross-examine the witness. But on cross-examination, your opponent can only probe into areas that touch upon issues that was raised upon direct, with some exceptions. For example, things such as credibility. A witness's credibility is always fair game in cross-examination. But generally, the cross-examination can only focus on things that came out in direct examination. Example, if in direct examination you only examined your witnesses about the facts of the car accident, but you did not ask about any injuries subsequent to the collision, your opponent can't broach that topic on cross-examination. Such a thing would should get an objection based on the fact that such examination exceeds the scope of the direct examination. Now, instead, if this were a real trial, your opponent would call that witness in his own case. So, in a real trial, your, the opposing side can call witnesses from the other side. The plaintiff can call the defendant's witnesses and the defendant can call the plaintiff's witnesses. But that doesn't necessarily apply in mock trial. In mock trial, both sides have three witnesses and they can only call those three witnesses. They can't call witnesses on the other side. So there may be some strategic value in avoiding a contentious area on direct to deprive your opponent of a key fact on cross-examination. But be very careful when invoking this strategy. Yes, you may consider not bringing up an issue on direct in order to deprive your opponent an opportunity on cross, but still, you need to be sure that all key information is testified to by the witness. When it comes to cross-examination, again, it's going to be limited to the scope of the direct examination. There are some narrow instances where a court will allow some questioning that is outside the scope of direct. First, a witness's credibility and reputation are always at issue and is always subject to cross-examination, even if it doesn't come up in direct examination. So, credibility questions, those are fair game. You've got to let those go. And further, because it's cross-examination, most judges are going to be willing to give the attorney a little bit of leeway. So, if it's a, if it's a borderline issue, most judges are going to be inclined to allow the cross-examination to continue. Now, that's cross-examination. What about redirect and recross? If you're going to do a redirect examination, you can only redirect a witness on topics that are within the scope of the original direct and the cross-examination. You can't bring up any new questions. And the same goes for recross if the opposing side chooses to do so. The recross is limited to what's been brought up. You can't bring up entirely new lines of questioning during the um, recross examination. So what are some good strategies for successful direct examinations? First, prepare your witnesses in advance and ensure key phrases and concepts are adequately expressed to the jury. This doesn't mean that you and your witness necessarily come up with a script, but both the lawyer and the witness need to be together about the goals of the testimony and what information both expect to come out in that testimony. Second, you ought to know the witnesses in the witness, the weaknesses, I'm sorry, in the witness statement. Every witness has some weakness. You ought to be aware of them. That way you can come out with some way of a plan of knowing how to handle those weaknesses when the testimony arises. Next, be sure to present the key testimony with a fair reading of the witness statement and the problem as a whole. You can get a little creative 
But if you go too far afield, you can expect an unfair extrapolation objection. And what that is is basically that the witness's testimony draws a conclusion that is more favorable to your side that goes beyond that in the written statement. And go to, to mock trial rule of competition 2.3 if you want more on the rules regarding what's fa a fair extrapolation versus an unfair extrapolation. What other strategies? You should have an organized and logical progression to the direct examination. Make sure that your direct examination makes sense and that the jury can follow it easily. So establish a foundation in credibility of the witness. Start off by making sure that the jury knows why this person is relevant and is worthy of being listened to. Next, hit the key facts. Show explicitly how does this witness help your case. Next, be sure that you avoid irrelevant tangents. In a lot of the witness statements in the mock trial competition, there's going to be a lot of good information, but there's going to be a lot of information that is completely irrelevant to your case. Part of what you have to do as a good attorney is identifying that information and avoiding it. But remember again, you've got a limited amount of time to present your testimony. Be sure that you avoid these irrelevant tangents. And finally, when it comes to key testimony, emphasize it with multiple lines of question. If it's something that's relevant but not as important, you might go through those quickly. But if it becomes more important, you might draw it out with more questions. So for example, are you certain you saw Jane run the red light? How was the weather? Did you have a clear view of the intersection? Is it possible you saw another vehicle instead of Jane's blue Corvette? How far were you from the intersection? Are you certain Jane was driving the car? Did you see anyone exit the vehicle after it collided with my client's car? Because who ran the red light is important, that type of questioning and that type of detail is important for the under, is important in order to allow the jury to get the best understanding of the case. So you want to make sure that you present it in the most persuasive way possible and doing and by emphasizing that key testimony, you're doing just that. So a lot of our discussion so far has been about the lawyers. But what about the witnesses themselves? Well, trials mean nothing without evidence. And witnesses give evidence in the form of testimony and documentary exhibits admitted through the witnesses. Great witnesses make for a great team presentation. Remember that under the Arkansas rules, a team can get a total of 110 points. 30 of those points are for witness presentation. And so what makes a good witness? Well, first, do you know the materials? Second, is your testimony true to your witness statement? If you keep making errors um, in your testimony, and if these errors come out in cross-examination, you're going to get a lower score. Next, are you immersed in your character? If the witness is a 65-year-old bystander, does your portrayal remind the judges of a 65-year-old? Do your mannerisms, do your answers reflect that role? If not, then you're going to get a lower score on the ballots. What else? Are you able to lay a foundation for key pieces of evidence paving the way for their admission? And so if it's something about the red light, you know, hopefully you'll be able to testify that Jane exclaimed to me immediately after wreck, the wreck that, hey, I ran the red light. How are you able to, to portray this? You're going to have to be able to show your presence at the scene, your knowledge of Jane's identity, and your ability to hear her statement. This needs to come out in your portrayal of the witness. You're also going to be assessed based on your ability to withstand cross-examination. You're going to be able to work a lot with your attorney on the direct examination, not so much on the cross-examination, because this is where the other team gets to control a lot of the question. And so, first, be sure that you stay faithful to the statement. If you make statements that are too far filled with your witness statement on direct, a good lawyer is going to be able to expose this on cross-examination. 
And if they do so, that's more points for the other side, less points for you. Next, you've got to be true to your statement and you've got to know it's your weaknesses. Sometimes there's going to be something in a statement that is just completely indefensible and you're going to have to give up that ground. So maybe, yes, you're going to have to admit that you were talking to a friend while the collision occurred and that that might have distracted your attention. Or, as often the case with a number of the problems in the mock trial competition, yes, you may have to admit that you've got a personal problem with Jane and that that bias might be coloring your testimony a little bit. By admitting these weaknesses, you can move forward with the case and you can deprive the the opposing attorney the opportunity to impeach you. Because if you admit it, then it kind of takes away a little bit of the taint of that weaknesses. But be sure that you stick to your key points in cross-examination and don't hesitate to, re to reemphasize critical facts of your case in the face of probing cr cross. You've got to be able to stand your ground. And finally, and probably this is the most important, while this is a competition, we, we try to provide an educational experience as members of the mock trial committee. And so, have fun. You're, being able, to, you're able to portray a character. Immerse yourself in this character. Be creative. Have fun with the character. And maybe if you have a little bit of fun, it'll help your team out as well. So, thank you for your time, and I hope that you'll find this video help.